And a special welcome to each and every one of you today. We are glad that you're here for the official members roundtable weekly. Um, we know a lot of you are watching this a little later and you have a busy schedule today, whether that be counseling, evangelizing, discipling, or preparing a sermon, which you could not break away from. We know you're watching this later. Welcome to each and every one of you. I believe the content that we're going to be covering is going to be especially helpful for each and every one because today we're joined by Josh Hirschberger, a dear friend of the network and been a member for many, many years uh, and a leader. Uh, at many of our Idea Nights, Idea Days, and Idea Summits. And we're excited to hear from him today on the topic that he'll bring. But before we go any further, I do just want to say welcome. We are glad that each and every one of you could be here today. I'm going to throw it over to uh, Andrew Peters and ask him to open us up in a word of prayer this morning. Ask God's blessing upon our time. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we love you. Thank you for the opportunity to get together, those that are able to. Uh, today, those that are going to watch uh, in the future. Lord, we're looking for other opportunities to grow our ministry. Uh, Lord, to be good stewards of the things that you've given us. Lord, speak to each and every one of us uh, this day. In your name we, we pray. Amen. Amen. Thanks, Andrew. Good to see everybody today. I am excited about our conversation today. It is politics season everywhere. And so I'm excited to hear what Josh Hirschberger is going to share with us. Before we go any further, um, I just want to say I know of a lot of guys that have reached out saying they are not going to be on today for various reasons. It's a busy time of year. Uh, I know there's a lot of fall fest going on this week and this weekend with a lot of churches doing a lot of things to try and reach their community. One thing I want to promote just briefly is the Idea Summit. The big summit with Tony Evans is going to be the end of January. I just looked it up. We are less than 100 days out from that. I think we're like 97 days until the Idea Summit. So make your plans to be with us in Dallas, Texas for that event. And I'm excited for it. Excited to see some of you guys. A lot of times we just see each other virtually, digitally, and it'll be cool to actually be in the same room with you uh, when that time comes. Uh, we're excited to have Josh Hirschberger with us. I'm going to turn it back over to Josh Tice just to give a formal introduction of our speaker today. And we're glad he's with us. How to minister to and partner with government officials. If there's anyone who could be able to speak to this topic uh, with great authority, it is our friend Josh Hirschberg, who's doing an incredible job in the Midwest there in Indiana and being an example to a lot of us of how we as ministry leaders can do just that. The Good Citizen Project is not only a great resource, an online resource, but a great podcast. And I want to encourage you to go ahead and subscribe, download, and and really uh, check out that podcast. And many of you already do. So you know Josh's voice and you know, understand Josh's perspective. There's rarely an idea day over the last five years that you would not be able to see Josh in person where he's speaking to the subject of what it means to be a Christian citizen in the society that we have today, a post-Christian world with a post-modern perspective. So what does that mean for you as a ministry leader, whether it be within the black robe regimen of the 21st century, whether that be as a gospel evangelist attempting just to navigate the culture. Josh speaks with great authority and he speaks biblically. So today, Josh is going to be speaking to us. We welcome him once again, how to minister to and partner with government officials in the year of 2022 in America. Josh Hirschberger. All right. So it's great to be back with you uh, speaking to this topic today been thinking recently about the biblical term of favor, uh, because there, there have been some things in our ministry that have happened over the last year that I can really only explain according to the favor of God. And I'll show you this, this photo. Uh, we've been praying for a little while, actually a, little, a long while, uh, for an opportunity to pray with, meet with our governor. And kind of out of the blue in February, that, that occurred, and we were given an hour in his office. And like we always do, and I'll, I'll kind of walk through this a little bit later, shared scripture. We asked, what are the issues in our state that churches can help with? And we prayed with him, and the governor gave us several things to work on, which I'll go through, but then asked us to go on a listening tour through state departments to figure out how the church could help. Uh, but then I asked this question, uh, so what's the best way to stay connected with you? <laughs> and of course, I'm angling for his cell number without like actually asking that, okay? <laughs> uh, and so he he gives us his cell number, and and now I'm like, all right. And I felt like I was in junior high. Like, how do I, you know, what do I text the governor? <laughs> and so he asked us to give us an up, give him an update from time to time. 
Um, so I, I did a few months later saying, hey, you know, I've gone through the departments you've asked me to, told him a story about a ministry that's doing some amazing stuff. And he texts me back a photo the next morning. I think he's at a state park just saying, you know, proof uh, beyond a doubt there's a God. He's, he's a professing Christian. Um, and so he, he sent me a photo. Now, like, what am I going to do? Like, I got to send him a photo. So I just kind of, I was hiking in a state park with my daughter. I, I just kind of pick up my phone and, and take a photo of the state park called Clifty Falls. It's something like 1,400 square miles or 1,400 acres, uh, but it's a large state park. I just randomly take a photo, send it back to him. The governor responds almost immediately saying, that's where I repelled back in college because he went to college close to where I live. Um, and then an hour later, he digs out this old photo of him repelling in the very spot that I took this, this picture. And so I'm just here to say, look, look, there, I try to be strategic, but that was only, that was God. And since then, we've been able to exchange messages, deepen that relationship. Um, and so I'm just grateful that as we try to minister to people, uh, we're, we're trying to do the best we can, but the Holy Spirit goes before us. And so that's just one example of how God, I think, has been moving in our ministry, and I know he's doing the same in yours. So I do lead the Good Citizen Project. I have kind of two uh, major things going. The first one, Good Citizen Project is national in scope, uh, writing, speaking, uh, legal partnerships. But then I, I would kind of analogize to a pastor that has a local church, but then a national ministry. Um, I just felt the need to be making disciples in my location. That takes relationship. Relationship takes presence. And I was able to join the folks on the family affiliated group in Indiana, and begin building relationships there. So just briefly, we have just a few minutes today. I want to jump in. All right. Why elected officials? <laughs> like there's an entire country to reach. Why should we care about reaching government officials? And as I, I pointed out in the intro to this, um, Paul, in his call to ministry, it included that he would stand before kings. Now he, he ministered to the demon possessed woman. He ministered to the businesswoman, Lydia, but he also stood before Agrippa, took the gospel to the middle of the, the ancient Roman world. But I was also looking at this verse, and I know you know this verse as well and better than I do, but it struck me recently that there's actually a sequence to this verse. It actually commands us to, there are four different types of prayer uh, for public officials. That's a fun study. But it says we're to pray for kings, for all that in our authority. But why? Why? Because or so that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty, basically so the church can fulfill the Great Commission without harassment from government. Why would the church want to be free to do that? So that all people, including those in public office, would come to a knowledge of the truth. <laughs> and in church world, we kind of use this idea of revitalization. And when God called me into Christian citizenship, I kind of stepped into the public square it took me a little while, but I finally realized that, you know, elections are important, lawsuits are important, but we miss the relationship component. I mean, we're commanded to pray for these, these public officials, public servants, but it's hard to do that if you don't know who they are and what they care about. Um, so over the last three years, we've orchestrated over 175 meetings between pastors and their public officials. We're closely partnered with, with groups in 15 other states. I'll explain that a little bit further later. But when I ask a pastor to come to the state house, and this would apply in your local context, maybe it's the mayor's office. Um, I don't ask pastors to come up to be lobbyists. I ask them to come up to be pastors. And principally, we want to have a, a nonpartisan meeting. And that term is very important. I'm not saying bipartisan. I'm saying nonpartisan, not in the sense that the different ideological positions are morally equivalent, but that literally when we step into a place like the state house or the town hall, we represent a different kingdom, and we're bringing those kingdom principles to bear in the public square. And when we do so, we want to minister to our elected officials in three specific ways. First of all, that they're a person. And I can tell you with confidence now that we've met on both sides of the aisle, that a person's ideological position or political agenda is not the sum total of who they are. I think of a particular representative here in Indiana who we have some policy differences, and uh, I think he recognized that. I recognize that. He came to Christ at First Baptist of Hammond, and he's the only uh, representative in the Indiana, Le Indiana legislature that's Hispanic. And he's a sharp dresser, and he's trying to break in um, to the, the lieutenant governor's office wearing sneakers. He's trying to change the dress code in the state house. So I just, it's, we have awesome conversations. Love this guy to death. 
but if like traditionally, if it was just, Hey, you have to agree with me on everything, we would not be ministering to him. So we want to minister to them as a person, but then also as a shepherd scripture says that those in public office are ministers of God for our good. They're literally put there by God appointed and put there by God. And scripture tells that the church's job vis-a-vis -vis government is to provide wisdom and guidance as the state carries out its, its God-given role of punishing evil and promoting good. And so when we minister to these individuals, we not only want to minister to them as a person, but then also as a leader of the state. Uh, Josh Tice raised a great question recently in the group of, you know, what is the church's role concerning kind of pouring into or discipling people as they go into public life? We complain about, quote unquote, politicians all the time, but have we done a good job of actually discipling them in their biblical role? And I come back to scripture here. I was just thinking through a few of the officials in scripture that had either prophets or preachers that would kind of come alongside them. For example, Moses and Pharaoh, Deborah and Barak, Samuel and Saul, Nathan and David, Elijah and Ahab, Micaiah and Jehoshaphat, Ahijah and Jeroboam, Jeremiah and Zedekiah, Esther and Ahasuerus, Daniel and Nebuchadnezzar and Cyrus, John the Baptist and Herod, Jesus and Herod and Pilate, and Paul and Nero. And these were not like token religious advisors that kind of sprinkled some holy water in and just, oh, whatever you want to do, Your Honor. No, I mean, Nathan stuck his finger in David's face and said, you're the man. And so we think, you know, if we're ministering to them as a person, then we become the, the pastor that they trust. If we're ministering to them as a shepherd, we want to tell them what's good. And we become the pastor that they respect. But then we also want to minister to them as a partner in the sense that the state is a God-ordained institution. The church is a God-ordained institution. So how can we work together for the common good? So I wanted to spend a little bit of time there because I just want to lay that foundation. Why would we go minister to this group of people? Next, how? And I want to be just as granular as I can and just explaining how would we do this. Um, it's actually pretty easy to get meetings. And I've shared a link for this, this pot or PowerPoint if you'd like to see it. Here's a sample email. We send these out all the time. And I always use the church's address because most of the public servants don't necessarily see you as a pastor. They see your congregation. And I am happy to use that to get a foot in the door. <laughs> all right. And so just saying, hey, we want to encourage you, pray with you, and think through ways we can meet community needs. And you can find who your state rep, state senator, uh, who they are on your Secretary of State's website. Um, now, there are a lot of public officials. I generally encourage pastors to think about four key officials to build relationships with. A mayor, a state senator, a state representative, and a U.S. congresswoman woman or congressman. These are key people that you can pour into. When we have a meeting, and again, I'll, I'll let you read through all of this, but I, I, here's kind of our best wisdom after 175 of these. All right, we always want to start with scripture, because if we only get five minutes, What's the one thing that's not going to return void? It's the word of God. And so things like John 10, 10, or 1 Peter 2, 13 through 17. And then I found that because we're not accustomed to talking with people that are different than us, um, often a good icebreaker is to ask them about what inspired you to jump into this area. And then I always will ask them, what about your work? We're grateful for your work on some issue. And I'll pull up their proposed legislation or Google what they've done. I have yet to find anybody that I couldn't say thank you for your work on foster care. There was one rep. He literally had removed licensure from shaving horses' teeth. And I, I was fascinated by that. It's like, you got to tell me about this. I don't understand why it's a bill. Um, and that broke the ice with this guy. We then asked the question, what are the worst problems in, your, in the district? And how can the church help? I'll tell you. Probably 85% of the responses across the aisle is the breakdown of the nuclear family. And so we have such an opportunity to pour into that. And that's the question, what's the best way to stay in contact with you? Because the whole point of the meeting is we don't want this just to be one-time issue. We're not here to lobby you about an issue. We want to build a relationship with you. May we pray with you. I have yet to have anybody refuse prayer. And we've met with uh, the, the first member in the Indiana legislature from the LGBTQ community, also one of the first Muslims in the Indiana Senate. 
And then you want to, you want to, as you walk into the meeting, you want to know where is this relationship going? And I, I know I'm talking to pastors. You meet a visitor from your church for the first time. You know, you're, if they're an engineer, you're asking them about what they do as an engineer or as a teacher, and you've got that next step in your mind. And so with legislators, maybe this person doesn't know the Lord. Maybe they're a Christian legislator that we want to help them better understand their role. So we have that in mind. Also, in, in the idea of, you know, how would you have difficult conversations? And again, I know I'm speaking to pastors. You're well equipped to do this. You do this all the time. But here are a few things that we've really found helpful. And I'll tell you, one of the conversations I'm, I'm planning on having in the next couple of months is a, a dear brother in Christ. Um, he loves Jesus, uh, loves Jesus as much as I do. But on, on some of the issues in public life, he will promote unbiblical principles. And, and so I'm really actually interested, because I, I know there's a lot of cultural and political history going into all of that. I really want to sit down with a cup of coffee and, and ask him, because I don't understand like, how he came to that position. So I'm planning on saying, hey, you don't have a lot of conversations like this. Uh, I'm actually nervous how it's going to go, because I appreciate you. I respect you. I want this relationship to continue. And I promise that I'm going to listen to what you say and consider it. And are you okay with that? And that way, as you head into this difficult topic, you're saying, hey, I value the relationship more than am I, I'm looking for a specific response. So again, I'm hoping some of this is just helpful, not just in perhaps the public square, but other, in other contexts. This has opened the door to a number of state-level partnerships in the area of foster care. This is the head of our DCS. Um, here's a meeting with our attorney general. Uh, we're working on the drug crisis with them. This is a member of the Indiana Supreme Court we've been able to build a relationship with, work on the issue of the drug crisis with, and then mental health. So I wanted to, I know we're, we're close to our time. I did want to bring on, um, Harrison, if you could just make it really brief here. Um, we, our team recently grew, and um, God actually led Harrison uh, Cardona to join our team. We're working with this individual, Dr. Ware, um, on some partnerships in Indiana. So here's some, if you might just introduce yourself and say just a little bit about what we're doing with Dr. Ware in Indianapolis. Yeah, so I'm Hershon Cardona. And um, one of the biggest things that we're doing with Dr. Ware is we're partnering with uh, his ministry called Grace Relations. And uh, he's uh, the uh, uh, former uh, president of Crossroads Bible College, now a College of Biblical Study. We're going to the streets and we're going to partner with IMPD, which is Indianapolis Metro Police Department and uh, going through different ministries of what are they doing with crime. And that's one of the petitions that we, we were asked by the chief of police, can the church help with the homeless and the crime situation? So we're gathering pastors around the table throughout the city and saying, what are the things that you guys are doing to prevent crime and how can we do something together? So that's basically what, what we're uh, bringing around this Grace Relations um, initiative um, that we're, we're partnering with. Yeah, and I, I so appreciate your zone. Uh, we've talked about like doing ride alongs in police cars, and I'm about the whitest white guy you've ever met. <laughs> and so <laughs> as we go into some of these urban areas, um, just the ministry context is one that I haven't experienced before. And so I'm just so grateful that that God brought her son to our team and able to expand um, our influence. So as we close, I'd say, well, when, you know, so we talked about why, how, when, um, with an increasing polarization in the United States, this is a wide open door for ministry, for pastors. I've been blown away that in a culture where like literally people can't have conversations on social media, people that disagree with us vehemently are willing to meet with pastors from their district. And so I just want to encourage you um, as you think about, all right, how is my church going to impact our community? The idea here is, well, let's go talk to the other institution created by God um, that's working on this every day. And let's see what ideas they have and what are the problems that they identify? How can we work with them? And when the, we know that the gospel is the answer. And so when we start seeing drug addicts completely transformed, and the state's like, how did you do that? We're like, Jesus. And that's the solution to this. I mentioned that it's 
efforts like this have now launched in 15 states, all the way from New Hampshire to Florida to Texas. Um, God willing, by the end of the year, or, or hopefully by next year, it may go to 25, um, and we're praying about D.C. as well. And so if there may be um, a, a ministry like ours in your state that literally you call them up and say, hey, I'm interested in a meeting. Can you connect me with my reps? And they will do the heavy lifting of doing that. But, but here's the vision as I close. What if every Bible-believing pastor in our country was actively building a relationship with their state rep, mayor, U.S. congressman and congresswoman, pouring into them as a person, as a shepherd, as a partner. How could we transform our country through the power of the gospel as we go into uncertain times? So I'm really excited about the doors that God has opened, the favor he's given to us, and hopefully these ideas are helpful for you as you're ministering in your context. Back to you, Jason. Awesome. Thanks, Josh. I appreciate that talk. Can you guys see me, hear me? Give me a thumbs up. Okay. Uh, I'm going to get some discussion questions to you guys. Uh, I'm going to throw these in the chat. There are five of them. Instead of breaking out into multiple rooms today, I think we're just going to stay put in this one. It'll allow us to discuss this topic as well as these questions. And then if you guys have any specific questions for Josh, uh, just go ahead and write those down. We'll get to those. Uh, we'll have a time of Q&A as well for him. Uh, he's got some resources there that he's listed, and we'll also put those on the Facebook page as well. Um, okay, number one, uh, what I'll do is I'll just moderate. I'll just read these questions. I'll start with number one, and then I'll open the floor uh, to you guys. What government officials are you ministering to? Uh, what would you add? Uh, that's kind of the first question. If you guys want to unmute yourselves, you can slip your hand up. Let me know uh, if anybody wants to jump in here and um, share. It's always tough going first. Nobody wants to go. I ahead. guess. I'll, yeah, I'll begin. Um, so first of all, this is not necessarily my realm. Uh, my brother is very gifted in this area. Uh, I love dealing with business owners and um, and entrepreneurs and uh, doctors and this kind of thing. My, my brother loves dealing with politicians and cops and firemen, all of whom intimidate me tremendously. I get really nervous around those people. Um, cops and firemen, I respect and love and, and just intimidated by them. And pol uh, political officials, I neither respect nor love, but I'm still intimidated <laughs> by them. And so I have to give past those biases when my brother's introducing me to these individuals. I guess a question that I would have, I, I, I want to answer the first question, but I guess I would ask this question for myself. How do you get past the internal bias, number one? Because again, pol politicians to me just really rub me the wrong way as a whole on both sides, um, if you do have that bias. Um, and then number two, um, how, how do you get past the intimidation factor of like, I know who you are. Wow. Like the celebrity factor, how do you get beyond the starstruck stuff? Josh. So, okay. So I don't know if someone else wanted to, to jump in as well. And I, I think this is part of the, I would call it kind of quote unquote political discipleship. Um, as I'm speaking in churches, I'll often mention a stat that something like 60% of American Christians receive little to no preaching or teaching on their role as citizen. And so I think we've kind of absorbed a little bit of how our culture does politics. And so the only thing I, I know to do is just to continue to go back to the word to say, this is somebody that is God's minister for good. And scripture says, I mean, as much as I might scratch my head and like, why, why is that person in there that they're literally God's minister? And I, for some reason, that has helped me some, that like God appointed this person in there, and I'm commanded to love them, care for them, even as uh, as much as they really, really frustrate me. And I'll, I'll often ask this question when I'm preaching at churches, and I, I convict myself <laughs> when I ask this question, but I say, look, think about the politician that you love to hate, and may or may not have shared a meme about this week. <laughs> Oh, when was the last, yeah. When was the last time that you meaningfully, substantively prayed for that person about their eternal soul, 
about their family, about wisdom and guidance for them. And we're just, that's biblical. And in fact, that's why that Timothy passage, I mean, the more I follow Jesus, the more I'm just blown away by like the simple disciplines of the Christian life. Christ has given them to us because he knows us, because we don't like authority. And we're prone to say, I don't like that person. I don't care about them. And, I, and so, um, Josh, I'm, I'm with you. There are many times I just have to pray, you know, God, help me to see this as a person, this person as a person that you love. Uh, because we can do, I think maybe we can do that easier if somebody is experiencing homelessness. We, we can sense that for them. But I think it's the same here. As far as the intimidation factor, uh, I'll just, the only thing I can say is just, you know, praying for God's strength. There's so many times I walk into meetings and I'm, I'm still like, you know, why am I here? You saw in that picture, I'm sitting next to the governor in this massive office with all of the former governors of Indiana looking down. But, ha you know, being in conversation with them and being able to, to meet with them, they'll often share, hey, I've got terrible back pain today. And if that got out, like somebody would use that against them. And so they're, I mean, they put their pants on the same way as everybody else. Um, and so maybe just a little bit of practice with that. But again, I just go back to asking God for, you know, the grace and the mercy to do it well. I love that concept of not only praying and asking God for grace, but being able to see them as just fellow human beings who, like you said, put on their pants the exact same way, who have back pain and, uh, and the pressure that they must be under. Um, so number one for me, what government officials are you ministering to? Um, the ones my brother introduces me to, uh, uh, both sides, he's had an opportunity of getting to know both Republicans and Democrats, which is really cool. I've had an opportunity of sitting down with some of our Democrat, uh, city councilmen and, um, uh, county officials who, uh, who, who really do see things differently. And in those conversations, it's been fun to say, like, I, I had a recent conversation with a man named David who said, who serves. Uh, and has for years, very well-known politician here, David Horsford, and, and ask like, okay, can I ask you a few questions as it relates to why you view immigration the way you do? And why is it that you think evangelical Christians don't? He's a, he's a God denier, not even claim to be a Christian. It was really a fascinating conversation. In our congregation, we have a city council person that comes to our church. Um, she's, uh, she's actually going to be running for mayor in two years, and she's a great um, uh, she's a great leader within our congregation, but those are the people. But again, this is not necessarily my realm. I'm interested to hear from other guys. Yeah. Who else here in the room actually has some type of ministry or even connection to a local official in your area? Anyone like that? Who, who do you have? Who do you connect with? Justin, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, this all happened when I went to a small town. Uh, I, I understood the same intimidation factor and, and micro metropolises and larger that I think anybody deals with. Um, when I got to a small town, I started talking to our chief of police. I started talking to all of our city council, all of our school board, our mayor, uh, the mayor in next town. Um, one of the things I discovered on the local level um, is just how intimidated they are. Uh, in many cases, they're intimidated to talk to the public. Um, and so, you know, we're pro, we're, in some cases, we're bigger pros at this than they are uh, because they stand behind a lectern um, ex almost exclusively or in a, in a community setting almost exclusively. So it, I think if you found that you could have an initial conversation, um, you'll realize that Oh my goodness, I just talked to our chief of police and half the time he's always suspicious when I talk to him. I have to like break the ice every new time because it's he, he's he's thinking, oh no, that another person's coming after my job. Oh no, something's messed up in my city that I don't know about. And uh and it makes for a great time to just to just create ease of tension that comes from not necessarily addressing the public except in confrontational manners. Um so I guess a big thing, uh, maybe don't walk in there as thinking their, of their power level or status, but see their humanity. Um, because I think if you see their humanity, you'll realize real quickly that, you know, they were watching football on Sunday with you. Um, they were doing the same things you were doing. 
and, and they just have a job just like you do that the public has certain expectations for that isn't who they are. That is really good. Hey, Josh, can I ask a follow up based on question one and two? How do you practically schedule a nonpartisan meeting at City Hall or at uh, the county or at the state capitol? How do you go about pra practically, like step one through step five of like mm -hmm. getting to that seat? Yeah. So, and to follow up on the, my last answer, this is one reason why ministries like ours, uh, we will do the heavy lifting. And in the 175 meetings that I mentioned, I, I was there to like facilitate it. So, and as Justin said, especially those that are, are non-religious, they're like, pastors are in here. What are they going to do? Like call down fire? <laughs> like what are, what are these? I mean, they have all these preconceived notions. And after just a few short minutes, and especially during um, and so shortly after COVID, the everything that public officials experience and things that pastors experience were actually very similar because they're leading people. And there was like, oh, you dealt with that and you couldn't make anybody happy. <laughs> and like, yeah, that was our experience too. Um, so practically, number one is going to be go to your Secretary of State's website or a similar website. If you just Google state name, who are your elected officials? Who are my elected officials? There, there's a database for every state where you can plug in your church's address or you know, click on a particular area of your state. And again, I recommend using your church's address to say, hey, I, because you're coming in as a pastor, you're coming in as a representative of, of the church. Um, each representative has a legislative assistant. Um, that's the person that you want to reach out to. And you, you know, send that email. I, I gave you the sample um, in the PowerPoint. And you're stressing, you know, I'm not here because they are inundated with calls, letters, text saying, I want you to do something. And so this often strikes elected officials as different. Like, what do you really want? I'm like, no, we, we want to meet you. I'm serious. <laughs> and sometimes it'll take a little while. I mean, for example, and we're actually ramping up. We'll probably send out emails in the next week or two for January because we're trying to connect pastors with who are busy, public officials who are busy. My preference is to actually meet on their turf because they that's where they're going to feel comfortable. And it also shows you care enough to go to where they are to get to meet them. Um, and then I gave you kind of the outline for a meeting. And as Justin mentioned that, hey, what, you know, what co compelled you to throw your hat in the ring? That gets them talking about themselves. And most people will get a little more comfortable after a few minutes if they're talking about themselves. Um, and then we're asking, hey, we'd love to meet with you again in the fall. Let's say it's a spring meeting and maybe in the district. So as you leave the meeting, you're trying to set up, here's where this relationship's going to go. And we often say, and this is a statement by a colleague of mine, that we move at the speed of relationship. So maybe you feel like you're really connected with this person on a kind of a spiritual note. Could we do a Bible study with you? Maybe they're really amped up about foster care. Well, how can I connect you with the ministry about that? Um, so that's the, the magic is oh, we live in the United States and we have the right to vote. Um, and that's why I, I sometimes wonder like if, if the apostle Paul actually had a, the right to vote, I just imagine he would have been using it to get in there <laughs> to meet with his, his reps. Um, and so one of the other big ideas here is I think a lot of pastors are already doing this at the local level. All politics is local. So your state rep, your state senator, and even your congressman, congresswoman, they have a vested interest in meeting you. So why not leverage that to do ministry? It seems like if you were to um, err in one direction, whether it be creating your own initiative, let's say Adam or Justin or Josh want to create their own initiative, or finding a group that is already doing this, you would err on the side of finding a group that's already doing this. How, how would you, it seems like Josh, that would be what you're saying. How do you find a group within your state that's doing this? I know you touched on it, but practically speaking, like what's the first thing I would do to find that, that group? Oh, you're muted. There you go. Sure. So I can send um, a, a list of the groups that are active. 
All right, so we have 15 states. We're moving to 25. I am. I have pastors in our network that I think are still waiting for a bait and switch in the sense that like they've been seeing our emails now for several years, but they're still waiting for the, oh, this is all about getting Trump elected, isn't it? <laughs> you know, and, and so in public life, like in any area of ministry, they, you have a lot of different ministries with different language, but that really aren't, they aren't, they don't have this model. Um, so if, if your state doesn't have one, I'd be happy to kind of walk along alongside you say, here's how you would get it started there. But I can send a list of the, the states that are active and could connect you with the leader in that state if the pastors either on now or later on are interested in doing that. Awesome. awesome. Anyone else, uh, you do something, you have some kind of relationship or connection with a local official in your area. Anyone else like that? Um. We had a lady in our church just got elected to the school board and she gets sworn in this November of our county, but it's all new territory for her and uh, for me. So any advice on how to help with that would be appreciated. It, school boards are, and especially with the rising concerns over the LGBTQ agenda, and then after the Dobbs case was sent the life issue back to the states, so much of state and local politics has become important again. And I imagine she may have run because she's concerned about what's going on in the local school. Um, I, you know, be there to encourage her, pray with her. Uh, we, we did this during, uh, Indiana was the first state to take up the life issue. So the day before the final vote, we took seven or eight pastors up and we weren't there to lobby. We we're just there to pray with them, encourage them. And so she's going to need a lot of support that way. Um, if she's looking more for kind of what policies can I, can I promote that sort of thing? Uh, what state are you in? Uh, I'm in Alabama. Okay. There's a, a, a group that I know in Alabama that could provide some kind of local and state and state guidance. So I'd be happy to connect you there. And, and again, so my, my basic tack is I want to pray with them but then also want to encourage them in their role as, I mean, they're just like I would an engineer or a teacher, any way that I can support them, I will. All right. Anyone else along those lines? If not, we'll move on. All right. Number two, how is your church impacting your community? Do you partner with government officials in those efforts? If so, what are some examples um, anyone here do like a, uh, like a law enforcement appreciation Sunday or recognizing any local officials, anybody do anything like that currently? Okay. All right. Anyone want to talk about impacting community, uh, what you're doing presently? We, we do a teacher appreciation Sunday and then the following Sunday, a first responders, uh, appreciation Sunday. And, um, which, you know, uh, that's, that's actually gained us a lot of, the, do you guys find it true that when you do something and then you do it the second, the third year, like there's momentum, like it gets better. So that's what we did. So we're like in our third year of doing that se second. And then next year will be our third year of doing that. And the momentum is growing each week for that. And that's opened up a lot of doors. And it's interesting because we're in a purple state. So you know, there's a, a lot of interest on both sides of the political aisle and certain groups within our church get really excited about the teacher appreciation and certain groups get really excited about the first responders. So putting them back to back has been really good for us. <laughs> awesome. One thing that we've done here recently is uh, we've done a law enforcement appreciation. We actually had our county sheriff who was an elected official you know, come and speak at that, which was kind of a cool event. But one residual that we've seen from that is uh, we've become a police officer friendly campus. And so we've seen police officers come to our service. And a lot of times they'll come in uniform, uh, which I think is, you know, it's a nice look. It's a safety, um, you know, thing that a lot of people like. I mean, some people, not everybody likes it, but some people will. And they'll, they'll come to events and stuff and just to have their presence around you know, makes it at least feel like a safe space for us. So we've seen a little bit of that, Josh, a little bit of the, the residual effect of that. Anyone else want to want to jump in on that stuff you've done in your community, 
um, outreach to the community along these lines? Any other thoughts there? Can I add that um, one of the things that we are doing is uh, we're, we're doing roll calls at different churches. So we are, we are advising churches to reach out to the commander, the district commanders, and uh, do their roll call in their church and invite community members so they can come in and meet and greet them. So while they're doing roll call, you, you can pray for them, you can meet them. It's all about relationship. And you don't know who that person is unless you invest in that relationship. So we're doing that. We're doing ride-alongs. We're, we're, we're asking pastors to, to get in the, in the police car and uh, ride along with them. And uh, that's an experience that uh, it, would, it would change your life uh, as you start seeing police officers have children, have family, they're human beings. And me being a former police officer um, and a pastor, uh, I can appreciate what they go through, uh, but only when you're in their car and see how they can make, they have to make a decision within seconds, you'll be able to appreciate and partner with them. And you, you'll be able to know how, how to pray better for them. And here's one, you may want to explain to roll call and kind of how, how that works for police departments. So every police department before the, the, the officers go out and do their assignment uh they'll they'll come in and um they actually have to uh you know go and check on attendance uh they go through attendance but they say hey here's a high crimes here's what's happening uh here's what happened yesterday uh all of these guys got in this incident or that incident and um uh, of course you you know as a citizen you won't be able to hear a lot of things especially if it's an open investigation but that's roll call so before they go out in their shift, they, they kind of like debrief uh, what's happening or what happened that week or who they're after. And uh, when they do that, you can uh, host that at your church. And, and a lot of them, if they have community and engagement, they want to do that. They want to partner with you. So that's, that's what happened in Roco. So happens in, here in Indy, happens in three different shifts, like five in the morning, 1.30 and 10 p.m. So you can choose what time and what day you can do it. Hmm, that's really cool. That's a neat concept. Um, Steve asked a good question about how Josh's ministry is supported. He gave an answer there, uh, website, good info, and then how you can get involved. I wanna get to number three, uh, which is what concerns do you have with ministering to elected officials? And an example is becoming overtly partisan, getting pulled into elections. Uh, so for you guys here in this, uh, you know, all together in this room, what do you what do you think? What are your hesitations? What are your um, you know concerns with with ministering and getting involved with politics along these lines? Any thoughts there? I mean, for me, it's it's because of of the community I live in. I don't. Um, I, I, I am careful because I don't necessarily push back 40% or 30% of our community one way or another. It literally is right down the line, 50% of our community. So um, one way or another. So uh, that's a concern that I have. And I don't really know how to answer that all the time. Yeah, agreed. Agreed for us. I mean, I feel like we're we're in um, we're in North Carolina, but we're we're right down the middle. We're a small town in between two major towns, and so we've got we've got a lot of people that go to our church who are Republicans and think that everyone is a Republican, and then we have a lot of other people that go to our church that are Democrats and they think that everyone else is a Democrat. And so, um, yeah, it, it's tricky because everything you say. Uh, could have a dual meaning to potentially both audiences. And, you know, ultimately you want to reach everyone with the gospel as opposed to, you know, leaning toward one side or the other. So I, I think, I think I would agree with you, Josh. I think that's a little bit of a concern for us when you have such a high concentrated percentage of people in your church that are on either side of the, of the debates. 
And for me, just for clarification, while this conversation goes the direction that it's going, it's not that it's not that I don't have my own perspective and it's not that I don't have a clear, my perspective is, is that once somebody knows Christ, they understand the gospel, their mind is going to begin to get shaped to where certain public policies like the support of the murder of the unborn and um, sexual infidelity, uh, sexual morality is going to affect the way they vote. Even if they're Republican, they're going to look at a guy like Donald Trump and see that Donald Trump is Donald Trump, who has not been a good man and probably still is not a good man. So all of those things play out as I start getting really political. <laughs> so it's not that that's not playing in. It's that I don't want that to be the first thing that they know about me. I really want my first thing they want to know about me or our church is the gospel of Jesus Christ. And there's some people that look at our church as a whole and are just never going to darken those doors because they assume wrongly. Um, and I don't want to I, I don't want to um, to lean into that stereotype. Uh, I, I want the gospel to be first. What are, what are your guys' thoughts on that? Do you guys find this as a battle, uh, a, a, a tension to manage like in your community like I do or, or, uh, or not so much? What are your thoughts, Andrew? Set me straight. Yeah, Josh, man, I'm, I'm right in the same area. First of all, Josh Hershberg, I appreciate you reminding us of, of their humanity. And Justin, you talked about that as well and our, our need to pray for our officials. But I, I almost feel like you know, kind of like dealing with teenagers, you, you give them an inch, they take a mile. And so anytime you mention to your church, anything that's even remotely dealing with anything political, man, they just, I'm in Alabama and we're so polarized politically and it, it becomes all they want to talk about. And, you know, they're, they're so overly interested in the kingdom of the United States of America and, and I, I don't even want to lean towards that because I want to make sure that our church is known for the gospel. And that's my primary concern. And we just we have a lot of scenarios where churches that man, I had a, a family that joined a couple months ago and they were at the church across the street, mile down the street. And finally, they got their daughter to come to church after a couple of years. And within seven minutes, this was two years ago, within seven minutes, the pastor said, man, if if you're not a Trump supporter, you probably just need to leave our church. So <laughs> there the daughter pops up out and leaves the church. And oh. I, I find myself so wanting to just fully distance myself from even the idea of some of that. Now, again, like Josh Ty said, man, I obviously have got a lot of my own personal opinions about those kind of things. And as people mature in their relationship with the Lord, it's going to start settling some of their um, decisions about hot topics when it comes to politics. I just struggle even mentioning anything in church. Um, and and I, I get some some flack about that, but it just, it, it is, you, you, you give an inch, they take a mile, and that's all they want to talk about. I'll add this. Um, the, other th the other side, and I think all of us have said it without actually saying it, the large percentage of your unsaved that you're going to come in contact with are probably going to have views that would be on the side that the minute you introduce this topic of politics, they are turned off. And you almost want to at least give yourself a chance for the, or give the Holy Spirit a chance to work before you are introduced. And I look at Paul as an example. Paul gave very basic political talks it was it was how to survive in community rather than how to who to vote for now, of course there was no voting back then but the idea was he wasn't attacking too many people rather he was saying you know pray for these leaders and these were leaders that were trying to kill him um which fortunately we don't have to deal with quite yet um and so it's probably good for <laughs> Like in the church, in the church house, I want it to be the one place where CNN and Fox News aren't at, um, whether it be in our talking points or anything like that. But I do believe, and what we've tried to do is let those kinds of conversations be outside and one-on-one -on -one conversations and breakfasts and lunches and people who are geared and want to live that out. Um, maybe having a more smaller group connection on helping them um, rather than let it be the, the church coming together. 
be the primary emphasis for political leanings. I have found that in discipleship and in small group, a lot of those conversations do come up. There have been many times over the years, and I've not been perfect on this, but there have been many times over the years that I've seen a lot of men and women look across the, the coffee table and across the, uh, uh, the group and be like, so, so that's why Christians think this way about like the election. Like, yeah, exactly. That's why. And I find that so much better than just advertising to people who already think like you. Um, it really does work. It's just a long-term thing. And in small group, I love what you're saying, Justin, in small group. And this, I'm sure all of you guys have experienced the same thing. If you haven't, it's like, it's really real. I'm not telling you something that's a fiction or a fairy tale. It happens all the time. And they'll ask those questions and say, yeah, yeah, that's why. Like, I think uh, Senator so-and-so is probably a good person deep down, but their policies go completely against what I would see biblically. And I'm not just talking about the social issues. For me, I can, I can biblically make a very strong argument for, for, um, for representative republic. I can make a biblical argument for capitalism not being necessarily the best uh, way to do it. But as uh, I forget who said it, it's the best of the bad ways that we have, right? And so these are great conversations for, for, for that are biblical connected, but for small groups and one-on-one, -on -one. that's what I've seen. Josh, what is your experience in talking to others about these kind of things? Yeah. So this is actually what you've described is one of the reasons I, I started the good citizen project a few years ago, because it seemed to me the pastors were kind of stuck in a very difficult spot where you have some members saying, why aren't you speaking up? And then you have others that the moment you say anything are just kind of perceive that you're overtly political. And as has been mentioned, you may lose your chance to share the gospel with them just because of their perception. So the way that I frame it, and I think I'm up, I need to count about 60, 65 churches that I've spoken at. Um, and, and here's the idea. We're called to follow Jesus in every area of our lives, including in our role as citizen. And I say, well, it's the billion dollar question. That's a million dollar question adjusted for inflation is uh, how exactly are we supposed to do that now? And so I go through the four steps that I set out in, in this book um, of saying, you know, here, what does the Bible say about this area? And then how would we live it out? And so I'll tackle things like, well, what would the issues be that we would care about in public life? Um, and there are actually things like you know, ethnic unity and justice, as well as religious freedom for all people. Um, and all of those are centered around the Imago Dei. And then we have to develop a, a conscience tab for Christians that we disagree with. So just trying to get people, instead of them being discipled by CNN or Fox News in this area, like, here's what the Bible says. I'm not going to endorse a candidate. I'm not going to tell you which party to support. But here are some, like, Dave Ramsey-like steps for engaging in this area. Uh, let me I'm going to show the, the PowerPoint again, and I'd actually welcome um, everyone's you know feedback if you're interested. And so we have the podcast, so we, we developed some resources for election season, and I'll drop a blog post, which is kind of a sample of this, which basically just says, look, the Christian life, we're called to steward our money, our families, our time. We're also called to steward our vote well. But doesn't say, hey, yeah. vote for somebody. Um, and so this link has um, a 30-day prayer guide. It has videos, blog posts, et cetera, where I'm, I'm trying to help pastors with the very problem that you've described to say, hey, you know, we're called to follow Jesus in this area. How can we do this well as, you know, keeping our ultimate allegiance in, with Christ and his kingdom? And thus far in the churches I presented at, it has been well received. Um, I've gotten good feedback saying that this was actually helpful in, in trying to navigate this. So, so that's my approach. I, one of the things that blew me away in 2020 was how many pastors I met that told me I had 30 people leave my church because I wouldn't get up in the pulpit and endorse a candidate. Like they would say, Hey, vote, vote biblically, vote according to your conscience. And it just struck me that, you know, Christians, you know, they were prioritizing a political party or tribe over their own like Christian community. And that's just out of, out of order. So how could we speak to that while trying to navigate all the things that have been talked about today? So that's my, my kind of basic response to it, trying to help people say, Hey, I'm going to follow Jesus in this area. 
it's tough, um, but it, it can be done. Um, so I'll drop here um, in the in the show notes a blog post, which is just kind of a sample of that, where I I took what Jethro said and I kind of play off of Jethro from the hillbillies um, and talk about Jethro, who is Moses' father-in-law, who gave like four qualifications for public office and then try to answer a few questions there. So I would actually, we're, I'm, I would love to be able to help with this issue and would love some feedback. Say, Hey, we think you, you missed it over here, but this is helpful. Um, so I appreciate you raising that issue and uh, we're trying to help with that. Hey, before we go, we're almost up against time. Uh, I want to kick it off to Q and A. Any any questions that you guys have uh, just during the talk or the discussion specifically for Josh Hirschberger? Josh, I appreciate your time being with us today and just sharing your insight. Any questions you guys would have directly for him? Yeah, I see your hand. Go ahead. Um, how much time do you think? Uh, it takes to have those four relationships you talk about. I think it can be now. I mean, setting up the meeting may take a little bit of time. I'm generally looking for 30 minutes to an hour with an elected official. I mean, so you're, and if you do it twice a year, you could perhaps do more. Um, but I think quarterly is a little much. You're both busy. And I mean, so I think you're talking less than 20 hours a year to, and, and, you know, text them, encourage them. But I, that's part of what I'm saying. I don't think it has to be a huge investment of your time. And it's, I, I definitely don't want to give the church another program, <laughs> but I, I think it can, and help, it can help what you're already doing by connecting you into the community. So that'd be my estimate. Real quick. What was the, uh, what would you say was probably the most significant, whether it be program that you were able to work with or something that you were able to do that caused fairly significant change from this relationship building? Yeah, so the, the one that I would say thus far has been the most significant is in the area of foster care. In the sense that the governor said, hey, we need help with it. We went and built a relationship with the head of our Department of Child Services. We now meet with her twice a year. She has asked the church to go upstream to keep kids out of foster care. Um, we've, we've now assisted with a program called Care Portal that a, a church can literally, literally show up with a bed or with food and keep a kid out of foster care. And I'm not saying it's just because of our efforts, but the church has really kind of thrown its shoulder into this. And for the first time, I think in a number of years, the number of foster care, the number of kids in foster care is under 10,000 in our state. We used to be like the fifth worst state in the country on this issue. And so, again, I'm not saying that was all our effort, but it does seem like the church is getting the message. The state says, hey, we realize we can't fix this on our own. So that would be probably the best example of it. All right, Josh, thanks for being with us today. Really appreciate your time and just investing into our guys. Uh, we're going to sign off here. You can find Josh. He left his website, his information about the Good Citizen uh, Project. You can check him out. Check out his podcast as well. Uh, we'd love to have him back. I want to tell you guys where we're going to be next week is November 1st. We've got Brian Sams back with us. Brian is going to be a speaker at the summit. We just had him not too long ago. Um, but the topic he's going to hit on next week is, uh, is going to be a good one. This came up in our discussion when we had him recently, but his topic is resting in God's plan for the size of your church. Do you wish you had a bigger church? Do you wish you had a smaller church? Um, God has a plan for you and your church and exactly where he's called you to be. And Brian's going to talk about that specifically next Tuesday. So you do not Jason. want to miss that. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Just before you sign off, I was. I was wondering if I could just say something real quick and ask yeah, yeah, please request. Do. Um, so I have some ideas, definitely don't have all the answers in this area. Um, and so I often tell pastors, I would really welcome your feedback on, you know, how do we minister well in public life in changing times? But I do want to ask for a, a very specific prayer request. I've mentioned this before, 
at some of the events, but I've been representing a family uh, for almost two years now, and their child was removed from their custody by the state. And our claim is that the, the parents could not in good conscience affirm this kid's transgender identity. The kid was removed. This is their biological son uh, was removed from their care uh, because of that. Uh, we've had it up on appeal. And just this week, we got a ruling from the Indiana Court of Appeals saying that basically Christian parents not affirming their kid, the state pulling them out of pulling that kid out of their custody, that that did not violate the, the freedom of religion or their freedom of speech, meaning, you know, you have the right not to speak something. Um, so we'll appeal, we'll be appealing that to the Indiana Supreme Court, but they kind of said the quiet part out loud, like we've all been worried about where is this, all this stuff going. Um, as far as I know, this is one of the first times in the country that this sort of thing has happened. And uh, we, we know where culture is going, but I, I just pray that I would ask for your prayers for the family. The last name is Cox. Um, you know, this is a family that's just said, Hey, we want to follow the Bible. We're not going to, we can't say something that's not true. And it's, it's been a tough week for them. So I would covet your prayers for their family. Absolutely. You said Cox is the last name there? Yeah, C-O-X. Okay. We'll pray for you and for your team, as well as that family and that situation. Hey, thank you guys for joining us live today. Those on replay, hope to see you back next week. You guys have a great week thinking outside the box. Take care. Bye-bye.